All right. So in Hebrews chapter 6, is, is, actually the whole book of Hebrews is great. I'm not going to be focusing much on Hebrews today. There's all kinds of, um, it's, it's kind of a difficult passage and a difficult book to understand. But we're not going to be really digging into much of that today. We're going to be focusing in more on those first two verses um, where he says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. What I'm going to be focusing on this morning is doctrine and the importance of learning doctrine and understanding doctrine. Doctrine is extremely important for us to know. Did you know that the word doctrine is found 51 times in the Bible? And then doctrines, plural, is, I think is another five times. But 51 times. There's a lot of references just to that word doctrine alone, let alone the concept of learning. So what is doctrine? Right? Just that word doctrine. It's not that difficult. It's basically just a teaching. Doctrine is, is something that's taught. It's something that you learn, typically like on a particular subject. So the reason why we started off in Hebrews 6.1 is that we have a lot of examples of doctrines. In verse 1 he says, therefore leaving. So in Hebrews, in Hebrews 6 specifically, he says, we want to go beyond this. We want to just go even further in depth. So he starts off this chapter saying, you know, okay, we're going to leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ, of the doctrine of Christ, you know, um, let us go on unto perfection. Perfection meaning like unto completion, being completely whole, understanding everything that God wants us to know. Not just the basics, not just the fundamentals, but the fundamental doctrines are very important. We, we, we need to understand them and learn from them and, and make sure we're founded in those fundamental doctrines. And then you can continue to grow and then you can go on unto perfection without having the, the, the foundation laid, without having these doctrines already learned and already known, you're not going to be able to learn the, the, the rest of it, so to speak. You know, we don't want to start digging in real deep and getting all these hidden meanings without having a good firm grasp of just the basic doctrines of the Bible. And he gives us some examples here. So he's saying here in verse number one, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Right? So first of all, we see a doctrine of Christ. And what is that? He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And that's where our salvation lies. Repentance from dead works. What's he saying there? It's turning from our ability. Dead works are the, basically the works that we do. Any works that we think are going to earn our way into heaven, those are dead works. We cannot earn, you know, we cannot achieve or do so much good where we think that, well, I've amassed all of this goodness by doing so many good things that this is going to buy my way into heaven. This is going to earn my seat in heaven because I've done so many good things. Hey, those are dead works. And the Bible says that, um, you know, faith without works is dead. So it says that's how your faith dies. But I believe that works without faith is dead as well. So these dead works that you have, if you don't have faith, those works are good for nothing. Now, if you do have faith and you do those good works, they are good for something. It's not to earn you salvation in any sense, but you can earn yourself rewards. You can get, God will reward you for the good things that you do. I mean, after you're saved, you have the Spirit, you have salvation, you don't need that anymore. But the good things that you do, you accumulate, you amass this wealth that's laid up for you in heaven and God will reward you for that. But the dead works, you need to turn from the dead works. If you don't have faith, you have to be thinking like, I need to, to stop trusting myself to get to heaven. I need to stop trusting these good things I'm doing and have faith toward God. That is what's going to save me. So this is what he's saying. This is a real basic concept, obviously. I mean, this is something that, this is the first thing that anybody needs to learn before they could go learning anything else about the Bible. They need to learn how to get saved. And this is why when we go out soul winning, I don't focus on these other doctrines like he says here in verse 2, the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. There's all these different things. They're all different doctrines that we can learn. I don't go out just trying to teach doctrine to people at the doors. I try to teach them just the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of that salvation, because that's the number one thing that they need to learn. But once they do that, then yeah, I will go into other things. Because once you have that settled, once you believe in that doctrine, now you can move on to others. So here's some examples, right? Doctrine of baptisms. 
we're a Baptist church. We believe in baptism. We believe baptism is by immersion. We, you know, there's all these different aspects of baptism. And people do different things. Some people baptize babies and they'll sprinkle them or pour water over them. All these different things that they do. But it's an important doctrine. It's a doctrine that needs to be learned. We can't just say, oh, well, whatever. However you want to do it, that's just fine. No, I don't believe that. There's, there's, these, are, these are important things from the Bible, from God's Word, that we need to learn. Doctrines are important, and doctrines are what, what separates us. But see, there's a, there's a move, and one of the reasons why I'm teaching this this morning is because there's a tendency among, I guess, Christianity in general, and I've, and I've brought this up before, but there's this, there's this tendency where people, they teach that we shouldn't be so worried about doctrine. They'll say, why, you know, why are you so worried about doctrine? Why are you focused on doctrine? That just divides the body of Christ. They'll say, that's, just, that's dividing Christians, and that's why we have all these different denominations, because you, you, so, you cling so much to your doctrine. We need to just not worry about that stuff and just all come together under Christ and just, and just preach Christ and Him crucified. That is a lot. That is wrong. That is a wrong teaching. Look, we are going to hold the doctrine. And, and one of the things I'm going to show you this morning from the Bible is the importance that God places on doctrine. That we don't just, just cling to rules just for the sake of having rules. And is it true that doctrine will divide? Yes, it will. Of course it will. But these things matter. They're not just, it's not just meaningless. These doctrines are not meaningless. Um, we could see even here, does God care about doctrine? Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2, because yes, God's word divides, but we're going to see a little bit about how God thinks about doctrine. Oh, especially, specifically about false doctrine. Now, the reason why there's divisions amongst Christianity that's based on doctrine is because some people hold to one doctrine and other people hold to a different one about the same subject, right? So, as I brought up, baptism, it's an easy one to think about. It's one that we know very well. Well, we're called Baptist. One of the reasons is because we believe in the full immersion baptism, but there's so many other denominations out there that would say, that's, that literally say, no, that is wrong and that's not how you do it. You do it this way and it's enough to separate Denominations are saying, well, no, we don't. I mean, we, we are so strong about it because baptism is important. I mean, this is one of, the, one of the basic fundamentals of being a Christian is getting baptized afterwards, right? After your salvation. It's not part of your salvation, but that's another thing. Some people think it's so important that, you, that in order to even be saved, you have to be baptized. We're not going to join together with that, with that school of thought, with that doctrine, that's a false doctrine. But just to give you a little bit of how God just views um, false doctrine, look at chapter 2 of Revelation, verse number 14. This is in John's uh, in these letters he's writing to these different churches. He says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to, cut, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Watch this last section. Which thing I hate. So this is, you know, basically Jesus Christ, his, his words going out to these different churches. And he's saying, you know, okay, I have some stuff against you. I don't like this about you. You've got this doctrine of Balaam. And then he says in verse 15, you, you, know, you have people also in your church that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He says, I hate that doctrine. If Jesus Christ hates a specific doctrine, well, guess what? We ought not to be following it, and we probably ought to be saying, you know, making it very clear, this is the doctrine we believe in, and doctrine is, so, is important enough for Jesus to mention it and say, I hate that. I hate that doctrine. I don't like that doctrine at all. And this is why one of the reasons why we, we need to make sure our doctrines are correct. Obviously, we don't want Jesus saying, yes, word of truth holds to this doctrine, and I hate that doctrine. We need to make sure we have the right doctrines. But it's, they're also obviously important. He doesn't look at it and just be like, ah, yeah, well, they're wrong about this, and who cares? He's not saying that. He says, no, I've got something against you. You're holding to a doctrine that I hate. And it's important. It's a big deal. 
Jesus himself taught a lot of doctrine. Now, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to have you turn to, uh, let's see, where am I going to have you turn? Because I'm going to blow through some of these. There's, there's a lot of verses. As I mentioned, there's like 51 verses. I, went, I, I, I have a lot of them in my notes. So I'm kind of going to just, just read through these just to give you the overall idea and the understanding. As I start going through these, you'll start to realize, okay, well, yeah, maybe we should pay attention to doctrine because it's just mentioned so many times. Even just in, with, with Jesus Christ himself. If you would please turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. I'm going to read from the Gospels, from, mostly from Matthew, Matthew and Mark about Jesus. Matthew 7, 28 says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Okay, Jesus is teaching doctrine. Matthew 22, 33. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. So again, we see Jesus teaching doctrine. Mark 1, 22. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Mark 1, 27. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Mark 4, 2. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine. And then he goes on and gives them the parable of the sower. So you remember the parable of the sower, real famous portion of scripture. The Bible's saying that that's doctrine. He's teaching them a specific doctrine. And that doctrine is talking about salvation, right? The, the seed goes into the ground and it's talking about people with the cares of this world choke the seed and they become unfruitful, right? There's all that stuff in there. That's doctrine. Jesus is teaching doctrine. Ma and then Mark eleven eighteen 18 says, and the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. Jesus taught a lot of doctrine. It was a big part of his ministry. I mean, doctrine is, and all doctrine is, literally, it's a, it's a teaching. It's, a, it's an understanding. We, we need to make sure that we're not just putting the wrong, you know, not enough emphasis on the teaching, on learning, on, on understanding all these different aspects from God's Word about, about everything. I mean, about all different subjects, that they are all important. It's not just the doctrine of salvation that's important. And yet, is that the most important? Yeah, especially for people who aren't saved. Of course it is. That is the most important, but it doesn't mean just because something's the most important, everything else doesn't matter. No. No, there is still a very high value on everything else. And once you get that most important thing settled, you move on and, and continue. But um, we're not going to ignore everything else just for the sake of the one. You're in 1 Timothy. Now, Timothy and Titus specifically, and I want to point this out, these are going to be the majority of even the usages of the word doctrine are found in the, the epistles to Timothy and to Titus. Now, Timothy and Titus were being taught and trained by the Apostle Paul. They were pastors of churches. So, understanding this much, when you read the Bible, it's kind of, you, you have your four Gospels, you have the Acts of the Apostles, and then you have these epistles of Paul to these different churches, and then you have these pastoral epistles. And they all, everything obviously is, is useful for, for understanding and learning, and it's all the Word of God, but understanding kind of who they're aimed at will help you to understand, you know, where, where to go to and where to look uh, for different subjects and for different things. So. When we, when we really want to understand how a church ought to be operated, how it ought to run a New Testament church, we're going to look heavily at the epistles to Timothy and Titus because he's giving them instruction on the New Testament church. They're pastors. He's saying, this is what you need to look out for. This is what you need to make sure you're doing. And this is the way the church needs to function. All this other stuff. Now, you get some of that in the other epistles to the churches as well, but really heavily in these books. And this is where we find the most usage of the word doctrine is to these pastors. And the reason why is because church is a place where you ought to be learning a lot of doctrine. It's not just a social club, and it's not even just a soul winning center. Now, it should be that, but we need to be doing more than that. We need to be learning a lot more than just that. I mean, there's some churches that talk about salvation almost every single week. We need, they need to be teaching more doctrine. I mean, yeah, salvation is important. Of course it is. But the whole point of church, though, is a, is a congregation of believers. I mean, these are people that already believe the gospel. 
We need to be learning and growing more. The, the, the gospel message is for the lost. That's why we bring that message out to them. The church, the congregation, we need to be learning doctrine. We need to be learning God's word. We need to be learning so much more. And we'll see this here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse number 13. He says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, then I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. So he's, he's telling them here to teach the people that they, um, they don't teach any other doctrine than, than essentially than what he's received. And don't worry about these fables, genealogies, all this other stuff that's just going to bring up a bunch of questions and doubt. He says, um, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Look at verse number 19 of 1 Timothy 1. He says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Verse, I'm sorry, verse 9. Did I say 19? 1 Timothy 1 verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now, this is kind of interesting here about doctrine because. He, in verse 9, he, he's talking about the law. He's saying this is why the law was made. He said it's not made for people who all, already are, are living righteously and doing things that are right. He said it's made for those that are essentially that break the law. The law is made there to point out our sinfulness, for example. You know, the reason why we have the law, the Bible says the law is a schoolmaster to point us unto Christ. And we need to understand that we're sinners, that we do wrong, before we could even be looking for a savior. Why would we need someone to save us if we, if we don't realize that one, hey, we're sinners, we've done wrong. We need someone to save us. By breaking God's law, we deserve this punishment. His punishment is hell, but we, that's why we need someone to save us. So, and he's basically explaining the same concept here in verse nine. He's saying the law, it's not made for the righteous man. The law wasn't made because the person who's already doing everything right, they just need to live by the law. No, it's for the, you know, the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, the sinner, you know, all this, this this whole list. But then and as he's giving this list, he lists up all these different things, whoremongers, men stealers, you know, kidnap, all these other things. That's why we have the law. And then he says, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine, and, and I've noticed this in a few places, is, is tied up with, with the law, with God's law. God laying out his law and learning sound doctrine. Well, when we learn doctrine, we're going to know, we need to learn what does God think about a specific subject? What is right and what is wrong? And that's what the law dictates. The law tells us, this is right, this is wrong. Don't do this. And this is where sound doctrine comes from, is understanding what God sees and what God views as being right and wrong. Look at, uh, flip over to chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. Chapter 4. Again, and that's why doctrine is so important. We need to know what is right and wrong in our own lives, in our daily lives. We make decisions all the time. We want to know what is right. What should we be doing? What is going to please God and what's going to make God angry? 1 Timothy 4, verse 6 says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. Jump down to verse 13. He says, Till I come... Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So again, we see the importance here of these things that he's, he's listing off for Timothy to do in the church. He says, give attendance, make sure you're, you're doing the reading, make sure you're doing the exhortation, you know, exhorting people from God's word and to the doctrine. The, the, the fundamentals need to be taught. These teachings need to be taught. Verse 16, jump down to verse 16 in chapter 4. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing thus thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. He's talking about how important, I mean, this is pretty important, right? He's saying by, by taking heed to yourself and to the doctrine, 
And when you, con when you continue in them, when you continue in the doctrine, in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And I don't, when it's saying save there, I don't think it's talking about eternally. I think this is just talking about saving yourself from a lot of grief, from a lot of problems, from getting, you know, being in um, bad standing with God, so to speak. Um, learning and remaining in sound doctrine will keep you from, from doing the wrong. And it's going to save you. Uh, flip over to chapter 5. We're going to see some more references here to doctrine. In uh, chapter 5, verse 17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And, and the elders, of course, are the pastors, the, the people who are leading and running the church. It says, Let them be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Uh, flip over to chapter 6, verse 1. 1 Timothy chip, uh, 6, verse 1 says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And then jump down to verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Um, I'll finish that off because I don't have it in my notes. He is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. So he's saying if, if any man teaches otherwise, if people are teaching other things, false doctrines... Um, it's saying that person is proud, they know nothing, you know, they dote about these questions, strifes of words, and they just bring up, you know, envy and strife and railings and all this other stuff. He's saying this is, this is how a serious, you know, true doctrine is. Because when you start teaching these false doctrines, these teachers of false doctrines have all these attributes. They're proud, they don't know anything, they're bringing up all this, this fighting and perverse disputings, railings. All this stuff comes from the false doctrines are being taught. So we want to make sure that we're getting the right doctrine. Now, 2 Timothy, flip over to 2 Timothy, right there, chapter number 3. We're going to read just a few more verses here about doctrine from these. We're going to go to 2 Timothy, and then the Titus follows right after that. 2 Timothy 3.10 says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. He goes on, um, He's saying, you've known my doctrine. You know what I teach because he's teaching it, obviously. I mean, he's making it, he's, he's laying it out there. And one thing as a church that, that, that I'll never do is hide what we believe. We're going we're gonna to promote what we believe and say, no, this is, this is exactly, there, there's going to be no question, no doubt about what do we believe here as a church? What do you believe about this issue? This issue? What do you believe about that issue? And it's funny because I was talking to someone at the, at the Yellow Pages because I've been trying to get our ads out as much, in, in the books as much as possible so people can know about our church. And um, we were talking about how, we're, you know, how I'm trying to market the church to people. And I said, well, it's pretty specific in general. The, in, in general, it's specific. But um, the, way that the, the people that we're looking for, because... There's a lot of churches that just, I mean, they don't, they don't really say a whole lot of anything. They don't really say anything that would offend, and they're not very clear on their doctrine. You know, so they just kind of reach out to just everybody. And I have no problems, you know, saying, hey, come on in and check us out to, to everybody. But not everyone's going to be looking for a church like this because... And this is, this is one of the examples he used because he, uh, he was trying to understand us, but he wouldn't even come out and like say it because the world has gotten so politically correct and it's gotten so wicked into, into people just now fearing even mentioning anything. He says, so let me understand this. So if, if uh, and he, he brought up Duck Dynasty, he's like, so with what that guy said from Duck Dynasty, you would be like, uh, like, okay with that. And it's like, wait, are you, <laughs> uh, do I believe that homosexuality is a sin and that it's wickedness and it's abomination and it's, you know, God says it's guilty of the death penalty? Then yes, that's what I, you know, if that's what you're asking me, then yes, just come out and say it. You know, like, don't, 
no beating around the bush. But that's how a lot of the other churches are. They, they won't make that sense. They're afraid to say anything about it because politically, it's, I mean, that's, that's a death sentence to come out and say something like that. Um, but that's not the way it ought to be in God's house. When you go to a church, you ought to know this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible teaches. And this is what we believe. And I'm not going to be afraid to say anything about it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of doctrine. There's a lot of teachings that, that make people uncomfortable that maybe people don't want to hear because either they've done it or, or what, you know, whatever. There's, there's different things that people don't want to hear for whatever reason. And I'm not going to withhold that truth from you because I'm afraid that you might leave. I'm going to just stand on the Bible and not try to and, you know, twist it to say something else and, and we're going to promote. This is, this is exactly what we believe. And if you go to even the website, you'll see a, a, our statement of faith. You know, we believe in a, in a post-trib, pre-wrath rapture. I'm not going to hide that just because someone might be a pre-trib person and, and not want to come to church for that reason or whatever. It doesn't matter. I mean, pick the doctrine. People get offended over all kinds of different doctrines. But we're just going to lay it all out there for people to know. But there's a lot of churches that, that don't do that. And Paul will say in here, he's saying, you know my doctrine. I've made it known. It's very clear. This is what I believe. And we're trying to do the same thing. We're going to make it as clear as possible. This is exactly what we believe here. And um, you know, I'm not going to make any excuse for it. I'm not going to try to hide it just to bring more people in. This is what we believe. And, um, and hopefully we can find a lot of other like-minded believers that are interested in the truth from God's word. And that if it can be just proven and explained and shown this is what the Bible says and okay I'm willing to accept that and this is this is who we are and what and what we like here is the truth just just laying it out from God's Word and we believe it because it's the Bible and it, and it says what it says but let's um, where were we so we did are we in 2nd Timothy right right we're in chapter 3 look at verse number 16 very important verse. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture is profitable. Excuse me, the very first thing he says there is for doctrine. Now, a couple things we take there. One, he says all Scripture. So, Old Testament, is it profitable for our doctrine? You bet it is. Because all Scripture is profitable. It's not just the New Testament. All Scripture. But it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, because the whole point of this, of, of this teachings and the doctrine is to get right, is to be corrected, to be instructed in how we ought to live. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 2. Another admonition from Paul to Timothy. He says, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. So the way that you reprove people, the way that you rebuke them, you need to be instant. And it's, by, it's one, by preaching the word. Of course, it has to come from the word. It's not your own opinion. It's not your own thought. It's preaching the word. But he says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. So you need to be long suffering. You need to not just be like, you know, um, people need to hear. And sometimes changes happen at a slower pace than we might like to. But um, there needs to be a lot of long suffering there so that people have an opportunity to learn and to grow and, and to, to kind of hold to, to new things. But you need to do that with long suffering and with doctrine. The teaching needs to be there. I can't just come up here and say, well, homosexuality is wrong. It's a sin. Without showing you why from the Bible. You know, because otherwise, why should you believe me? And why should you? That's a good point. I mean, why should you believe me? If I just say something, even if it's true, if I, just, if I just make a claim, there's no reason to just believe me at all. None. The reason comes from this book, which is why I always try to prove. That's why we're going through all these, these mentions of doctrine, because what I'm trying to teach you this morning is that doctrine is very important for the New Testament church. It's not something to be ignored. It's actually very important, and it's something that we ought to be getting in our churches. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 3. He says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And we see here the, the implication is that sound doctrine oftentimes... Well, well, people don't want to hear it. 
because the, the opposite of sound doctrine is people who just want to have their own teachers just have itching ears and you're saying, well, just, just give me a good scratch right here. And, oh, yeah, that feels good. This is, that's the type of teacher they want. It's just, oh, just make me feel, oh, yeah, that's good. That's, yeah, right there, that makes me feel a lot better. That that's what they're looking for. That these itching ears just, just to hear what they want to hear not necessarily what the truth is. And he says in the latter times, and you know, in the last days, that's what, that's what it's going to be like. There's going to be a lot more of that type of person. They don't endure sound doctrine. The implication there is that sound doctrine will make people uncomfortable. It's not going to be the type of doctrine that's just the, the itching of the ears, the scratching of the ears. Um, look at Titus. Titus is the next book over. Titus chapter 1. Verse number 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So the people that, that are speaking bad against you, hey, you need to have this sound doctrine. And that's why, again, doctrine is important for everybody in the church to learn, not just the pastors, because when you're communicating with other people and you want to be able to prove to them why thus and so is a sin, why we shouldn't be doing this, why, you know, why we shouldn't be watching all the movies that Hollywood puts out. Well, why is that? Is it just my opinion? Or is it because the Bible says I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes and you have on the screen people who commit adultery and fornication and um, you know, are getting drunk and doing all these, all these various sins are just being put in front of your face when the Bible says I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside it shall not cleave unto me. The, you know, and there's a lot more. I'm not going to do a whole sermon on that, but um, um, not this morning at least. Understanding the doctrines and the teaching and the principles and the scripture will help you then to be able to convince the gainsayers to say, well, this is why. This is exactly why. And this is exactly what I was doing just yesterday. I was out soul winning and I was trying to um, convert a Jehovah's Witness. And this guy has been you know, being taught by these Jehovah's Witnesses, and, but he's still relatively new, which is a good thing because it you know, gave me an opportunity. He was still open enough to talk and to hear what I had to say. But I'll tell you what, it required a lot of work. And, you know, he didn't get saved. I don't know. Hopefully he'll, he'll, he'll receive something that was, that was shown him. But I'm showing him, like, why their doctrine is false and proving and going through the scripture and saying, look, it's not just because, oh, I'm Baptist and they're Jehovah's Witness and they're wrong because I'm Baptist. That's not a good reason at all. That's a very, that's a very foolish reason. The reason is because, well, look, and I showed them, the, the Bible says, look, Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Why? And I showed them many verses. Isaiah 9, 6. I showed them, we, we went to Isaiah 4, and I was just like, well, who's the Savior? And he says, oh, it's Jesus. Okay, well, let's turn to Isaiah 43. Let's look at Isaiah 45, where Jehovah God, because everybody was going to say Jehovah, the Lord, he says, I am the Savior, and beside me there is none else. I, even I, am the Savior. So, well, who's the Savior? Is it Jehovah or Jesus? He doesn't believe that they're one. You know, we believe Jesus Christ said, I and my Father are one. That's no problem for us as believers in Christ that He is God in the flesh, that, 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 that there's this Trinity, the, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There is no problem with the Old Testament God saying, I am the Savior and there is none else, and Jesus Christ being the Savior because they're one. Because there's one Savior, there's one Lord, there's one God, and those three are one. But the Jehovah's Witnesses have a big problem with that because they're not one. They're separate. So how can you have a Savior that's Jehovah and then a Savior that's Jesus Christ? And I'm pointing this stuff out to him. But um, anyway, you know, I'll probably do a whole sermon based on that as well. But the, the point is, with you, we need to understand the doctrine for ourselves. When you understand the reasons why you believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, because you understand the Scripture has been proven to you. Not just because someone says, well, at Baptist churches, we believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Is that true? Absolutely. But... Don't just accept it because someone says it. Accept it because as the scripture says and because you know it for yourself and you've learned that doctrine and say, yes, this is exactly what the scripture teaches. We all need to have this, this sound doctrine. Titus 2.1 says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Titus 2.7 seven. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. So he's saying, I want your doctrine to be perfect. I want it to be no 
errors in it. We, we want your doctrine to be uncorrupt. He says, gravity, sincerity, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. Um, in verse number 10, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now, that was just a lot of verses just to show you the ad admonitions of Timothy and Titus about how important doctrine is and how it should be a part of their teachings. Now, the Bible also warns us we have many admonitions. Turn, if you would, to um, Romans 16. I want you to see this in Romans 16. There are multiple places in the Bible that warn us about false doctrines and about those that teach false doctrines. It's one thing to hear a false doctrine, um, but then there's, there's those that are promoting these false doctrines as well. And the people who are promoting the false doctrines, you have to watch out for them. And Romans 16 tells us, um, verse number 17 of Romans 16, he says, now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So what's he saying to do? He's saying, mark those people. Hey, those people who are causing divisions within the church, that are, that are making offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've already learned. You've already learned these these fundamental doctrines. And when people come in and start to tell you, you know what, actually, you know, baptisms, you don't need, you don't need to do immersion. It's just, you just sprinkle or pour. Or we should start baptizing babies. You know, whatever it may be, whatever the doctrine is, you've already learned that doctrine. You're already founded in that doctrine. Someone comes in and starts teaching a false doctrine. Hey, mark, note that person. Mark that person and avoid them. Don't have anything to do with that person. Because when they're wrong, and here's the important thing about doctrine. When you're wrong about one doctrine, and you're trying to make the whole Bible fit and be consistent, it, it impacts many other doctrines along the way. You start having what you start tweaking God's word, you start tweaking these doctrines, it, it has this, this effect that continues to go on and on and on um, with other doctrines. And it, it's, for, I mean, a great example is the pre tribulation rapture. Now, we're, we're a church, like I said before, we believe in the post tribulation rapture, but pre wrath. We're not going to be here for when God lays out his wrath on the earth, but we are going to go through hard times and trials before that rapture actually takes place. Now, um, again, this is, and that's kind of a whole nother study, a whole nother sermon for another day, but um, believing in the pre-tribulation rapture requires certain other beliefs in order for it to even try to make sense within Scripture. Because when you go to a verse, or you go to a, cha a, a passage like Matthew 24, where the Bible very clearly says, and after the tribulation of those days, the sun and moon shall be dark, and the earth shall, uh, the, the the stars shall not give their light, and um, I'm totally misquoting it now. But um, and then shall the four angels gather together the elect from from the earth, from the one end of the other, end of heaven unto the other. It's saying, you know, it very clearly says after the tribulation, you know, the the, the angels are going to gather together the elect. Well. Again, we believe that the elect are those that are saved. Those are believers. That's who the elect are in the Bible. But in order to believe in the pre-tribulation, in order to make that fit with the pre-tribulation rapture view, now all of a sudden you have to say, well, the elect, that's not really the believers. That's the Jews. That's this other group of people. So now you start, okay, you got to make it fit. Well, now, now this has to change. Now we're talking about specifically this. He says, oh, well, that, he was only talking to his disciples in that passage, is what they'll say. So that was just for them. That's just for the Jews. That's not for Christians. They start, they start dividing up the word wrongly into thinking that there's all these different doctrines for different types of people. And it's just not the case. But there's so many things where, where, where that is... Um, you have to change multiple doctrines in order to believe that. And he says, that's why you want to mark that person and avoid them. When you spot the one like major false doctrine that they're trying to teach you, well, guess what? They're going to have a lot of other false doctrines besides just that one, so just avoid them. Mark 12, 38 says, And he said unto them in his doctrine, talking about Jesus Christ, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing, and love salutations in the marketplaces. He's, he's telling his people, you know, to beware, beware of these people, beware of those scribes that that it's all about them, that they're lifted up in pride, and they teach these things. They teach for well, the Bible says that they teach for doctrines the commandment of man. 
And that's what the Pharisees were doing. That's what the scribes were doing back in Jesus' time, is that they were coming up with their own opinions. Like when, when the Pharisee gave Jesus our time, he was saying, oh, don't your disciples wash before they eat? Because they saw him walking through the fields and picking corn and eating it, and they're like, oh, you're eating with unwashed hands. And they're putting that up as if that is a doctrine coming from God himself when God never said anything in his law about having to wash your hands before you eat your food. Now, whether or not it's a good idea doesn't even matter because they're saying that all of a sudden that is just like a doctrine of God. Like that that's, that's scripture, that that is just gospel, that is the gospel, that's the truth from God's word that you have to do this. They're making up their own rules. And Judaism is filled with that. It's filled with all kinds of rules that they've come up with that are doctrines that are according to man and not according to God. But um, let's see, Ephesians 4.14 4, says, um, and turn if you would back to 2 Timothy. I'm going to go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Ephesians 4.14 4, says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are people out there that are, that, that are very cunning and they're very crafty in the way that they, they form this doctrine and they literally are lying in wait to deceive. They're out to trick people. And this is, this is a foreign concept I believe it because it's there, but it's still hard to understand sometimes that there are people like this even exist. Because most of us have a heart or have an attitude where you're not just out trying to trick people. I mean, you're living up. Yeah, do you make mistakes? Are you wrong about something? Sure you are. But your goal and your intent isn't just to trick people. I mean, the majority of people you meet probably aren't like that. They're probably not that type of person where they're just, just looking to trick you and looking to get one over on you. But they exist. And we're warned time and time again that these people are out there. They're out there looking to deceive you. They're looking to trick you. They know what's wrong. They know what's right. And they're out there still trying to trick you. And they're trying to deceive you. That's what the Bible's saying right here. They lie in wait. I mean, they're, they're hiding out and they're waiting and, and setting a trap for you. So he says that we need to be no more children. We can't be a child in the faith. We need to grow. We need to learn doctrine. We need to learn from God's word so that we are not deceived. We're not just carried about with every wind of doctrine and being like, oh yeah, that sounds good. Oh yeah, this sounds good. And you know, one week you believe in this, one week you believe in that, and there's all these different things. You hear, oh yeah, that's, that sounds great. That, we're not, that we get founded. We get settled in God's word and settled in the truth that we can actually grow. The Bible talks about us... Um, I was going to say, this is going to be a point for later. I'll just go over it right now. The Bible says that um, in Isaiah 28, 9, he says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So he's saying, you need to be weaned. You know, the, the milk of God's word, so to speak, is going to be wrapped up in the gospel, in in, in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, understanding the very, very, very simple, basic truths about salvation. But in order to grow, you need to start to learn more of God's Word in order to receive the true meat of the Word. You know, the, the, the stuff you can really dig into and get that full meal from. Babies, when they're infants, they're, they're, they're little children, they, 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 they suck on their mo mother's breasts for, for their sustenance, for their, for their, to, to continue growing. But that's a pretty plain, you know, um, food that you're getting. You know, the, 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 what they're getting, it's not, there's no choices there. It's always the same thing every single day. But they need that. I mean, they need that as they start to grow. But once they grow, get to a point. I mean, can you imagine a, a, a 10-year-old and all, all their nourishment is still just, just from the mother's breast? That would be ridiculous, right? I mean, it's silly. But what we have today, we have a lot of Christians that are in that same boat. Because they're not reading their Bible, because they're not learning, because they're not even coming to church or they're not going to church that teaches doctrine, that they're at this stage, maybe they've been saved for 10 years or 20 years, but they're at the stage where they just, just haven't grown. Spiritually, they just haven't grown. They're still getting that milk from the Word. We need to make sure that we're growing. And the way that we do that is by, number one, reading the Bible for yourself, 
I cannot stress this enough. You need to be reading your Bible every single day. You need to be doing that. You need to have the Holy Spirit teaching you from His Word. This is where you should get the majority of your learning is from, is from your Bible reading. Now, you come to church, yeah, because I'm going to be able to point some things out to you that maybe you didn't see you know, in your reading and, and be able to learn some stuff. And that's important as well. We already saw Timothy and Titus. I mean, they're being stressed to teach doctrine, teach doctrine. Obviously, church is a place for learning doctrine, but you need to learn it for yourself so that you're not tossed to and fro as well and that, and that you can know that what's being taught, what's being presented to you is truth because you've read it for yourself. And you can say, okay, well, this is lining up with what he's saying because I, I, you know, I've read this. I, I read this chapter. I know what this is talking about. I've read this before. And... Um, Here's another good way to know doctrine. The Bible, Jesus Christ said in John 7, 17, he says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He said, if you're doing God's will, if, you're already, if you've already learned enough to know what God wants for you to do and you're doing it, when you hear more doctrine, when you hear more teaching, when you hear people present more stuff, he says, you're going to know whether that doctrine is of God or not if you're already doing God's will. And, um, I mean, that's what Jesus Christ said in John 7, 17. Now, um, I had you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, right? Because this is important as far as um, false doctrines. And I said we, have, we need to mark those and avoid those that teach false doctrine. And we see an example of that here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. And again, study to show yourself approved unto God. It's not study to show yourself approved unto everybody else in the church. That's not why you say you don't study so that you could, you could look good in front of everyone else and be like, oh, look at how much Bible I know. That's not the point. The point is to study to show yourself approved unto God. God's the one you're looking at. And I'll tell you what, if you're studying just to show yourself approved unto man, the bar is going to be a lot lower. I mean, to, to impress other people with your Bible knowledge, oftentimes it's not going to take very much. You know why? Because so many people don't read their Bible at all. So impressing people with your Bible knowledge, you'd be like, oh, wow, you actually know the Bible. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised sometimes just at the door when, when someone even says that they've read the Bible ever, like in their whole life. Because so many people haven't. So, but when you study to show yourself approved unto God, now your standard's going to be a lot higher because now you're, you're approving yourself unto God. God, I want you to be satisfied with how much I'm studying, with how much I'm reading. And you think about that for a while and hopefully that will help you to want to do more. It says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So you are a workman. You, are, you have work to do for Christ. And if you don't know, if you're not studying, if you're not studying the word, you're going to be ashamed because you're not going to know what to do. You're not going to know what to say. You're not going to know how to answer people. He says, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to understand what's true and what's not in the Bible. I mean, you know, some things between the Old Testament have changed from the New Testament. We need to understand what those things are. Obviously, we're not offering a lamb sacrifice this morning. We're not doing those things anymore, right? But, but you wouldn't know that unless you're able to rightly divide the word of truth and say, well, this is why. There's a reason for that because Christ is the Passover because he was slain once from the foundation of the world. Those were things for the time then present that we learn in Hebrews. It was pictures. It was, it was an understanding of there is a Savior to come. And it, and it, and it you know, symbolized and represented the shedding of blood and the sacrifice that he made for us. But once he came and fulfilled that, that part of the law is fulfilled. And there's so many other things that are similar to that. But we need to understand, well, what aspects of the law have been fulfilled and, we're, and are not necessary for us to, to adhere to these days? But which ones aren't? Because they're not all just done away with. God's entire Old Testament law, they're not just all gone. There's still plenty of laws that we need to be obeying today. So rightly dividing the word of truth will help us to do that. Verse number 16 says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So now we see very specifically, Paul is naming by name two individuals. He's saying, Hymenaeus 
and Philetus. He said, these two guys, they're overthrowing the faith of some with their false doctrine. People like to get upset sometimes when you name people's names and say, oh, you know, they're working for Christ, you're working for Christ, you shouldn't be just bad-mouthing this person. Well, no, when they're overthrowing the faith of some with their false doctrine, I will name the names. Like the John MacArthur's out there. And the, uh, and, uh, um, what's that other? Paul Washer. These are people who are popular kind of online, and they teach these doctrines of, of you have to, you know, be turning from all of your sins in order to be saved, as opposed to just the free gift of salvation. And they mix in their works with the faith in order to, to say that that is somehow what saves you. And it's a damnable heresy, and these people need to be marked and avoided. And say, watch out for these guys because they're false prophets, they're false teachers, they're teaching false doctrine. You need to stay away from them. The Apostle Paul did the same thing. He says here with Hymenaeus and Phineas, and what were, they, what were they wrong about? He says, saying that the resurrection is past already. The resurrection to come, right? The, 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 the one that we're looking for still. He's saying the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. And if you remember when we started off in Hebrews chapter 6, we had some examples of doctrines. One of them was the resurrection of the dead. That was one of the doctrines we said, leaving behind these doctrines you know, of dead works and faith and, and, and of the resurrection of the dead. He's saying this is one of the, the primary, one of the elemental um, doctrines we're, gonna, we're done with that. We know that. We're going to move on and keep moving forward. This is one of those doctrines that Hymenaeus Philetus were, were teaching against. They were teaching this false doctrine, and it was enough for Paul to say that, I'm going to mark these guys and avoid them because they are teaching this false doctrine, saying the resurrection is past already, and that was overthrowing people's faith because you can see in the, in the Scripture the, um, you know, the, these references to the resurrection to come and... Um, they were, they were teaching otherwise. Now, Jesus Christ told us as well that you know, one of the reasons why we want to mark and avoid these people is because their doctrine is that corruption spreads and it's likened to leaven. So like, the, I'll, I'll just read it for you. Matthew 16, 12 says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So he, he likens false doctrine to leaven. And I don't know a whole lot about, about making bread and stuff, but I know enough that um, when you have the dough, you only need a small amount of leaven that mingles in with all the rest of the... You have this huge pile of dough that's going to be the bread and just a small, a real small amount of leaven that will mix in and spread throughout that whole lump. But then that whole lump has leaven in it. There's not like there's unleavened part. The, that leaven spreads throughout the whole thing so that the whole piece that you... The original you know, piece of dough, I guess I'll call it, that you started with, it all has leaven in it. And that's what Jesus is likening this false doctrine to. Say, hey, you, you, you know, this false doctrine starts getting introduced, and it's just going to creep in and kind of, and kind of encompass all of your doctrine and, and, and all of your teachings. And that's why he's saying it's so important to just mark it, avoid it, get rid of it, cut it out. You don't want that leaven. We want unleavened bread, right? We don't want the leavened bread. We want to get the leaven out so that doesn't infect all the rest of the of the doctrine. And um, just a couple more verses. We're almost done. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.1, He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's a pretty strong statement, doctrines of devils. We definitely want to make sure we're not learning doctrines of devils. We want to learn the doctrines from God. And he says in Hebrews 13.9, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So obviously we, get our do we need to get our doctrine from church. We need to get our doctrine on our own from God's word. Um, Proverbs 4, 2 says, For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. So keeping God's law is a very good doctrine. Um, I already went over these. So the last point I want to make, turn if you would to 2 John chapter 1. 2 John chapter 1, all the way, almost right before the book of Jude in Revelation. You have Revelation if you're going backwards and then Jude and then 3rd, 2nd, and 1st John. 2 John, we're going to see a teaching here that a lot of people may have never heard before. Um, 
And this has to do with how do you deal with someone who is bringing a false doctrine or false gospel to you. Look at verse number 9 of 2 John. Verse number 9 says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. We're talking about salvation, the doctrine of Christ, right? Hath not God. So he's saying if, if someone doesn't have the doctrine of Christ, they don't have God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. Now, I bring this up because there are people who go out and they bring this false doctrine. They don't have Christ. They don't abide in the doctrine of Christ. Specifically, I'm talking about the Jehovah's false witnesses and the Mormons because they go out and they'll knock on your doors the same way that we do. We go out and we knock on people's doors and we try to give them the gospel, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They go out and try to do the same things, but they don't have Christ. They believe in a works-based salvation. They're not saved. They're not trusting in Christ alone for their salvation. They believe in works. The more, and, and you ask them. If you don't believe me, ask them what they believe. Ask them how you need to go to heaven. Just ask them. Say, what do I have to do to be saved? If it's Jehovah's Witness, they won't even say that you could probably even make it to heaven because there's only 144,000 that they believe go to heaven. So just to make it simpler for them, just ask them, well, what do I have to do to be saved? Because they've got this whole other concept and it's just really weird. But um, they'll tell you. I, I talked to the guy yesterday. So you gotta, you got to do good things. you got to obey the commandments. you got to do what's right. Mormons will tell you the same exact thing. Because Mormons will tell you, well, faith without works is dead, so you got to have works. Yeah. That's what they'll tell you. <laughs> and that just proves they don't have the, gospel, the, the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is it's a free gift. The doctrine of Christ is that he paid for it all. That's the doctrine of Christ. We receive it freely. It's given to us because God loves us. And he's paid for it. We just have to receive it. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in the house. That's what the Bible says. That's the doctrine of Christ. Now, if someone comes to your house and brings you that doctrine, should we be inviting them in and saying, well, come sit down. I want to show you the doctrine of Christ. Or when they leave, okay, God bless you. Have a good day. According to the Bible, no, we should not. And, and, and look, I understand this because my natural reaction, when you talk to people, you say, well, have a good day. Have a good day. Have a good day. You know that good is really derived like from, you know, it's like God's speed. Right? So you bid them God's speed. Or when you basically tell someone to have a good day, you're basically bidding them God's speed. It's, it's, it's the same thing. And he says, don't bid them God's speed. Now, it's a natural response or natural reaction for me to be able to say, well, okay, well, have a good day. When you, when you depart from somebody. But we need to get over that in this situation where someone comes and brings you a false God, because they're a false teacher. They're out s literally sending souls to hell with their damnable heresy. It's not a good thing. It's not something that we can just take lightly. You have to make sure, do not invite that person into your house. They are not welcome in your house. It doesn't mean you can't chat with them for a minute at the door and, and attempt to try to give them the gospel, you know, you, you can't, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that, trying to show, hey, no, you, you guys are wrong. You need to show this. But don't let them teach you and don't invite them into your house and don't bid them a good day. Don't bid them Godspeed. And in fact, Galatians chapter 1 tells us exactly the opposite of, of telling them to have a good day. And this is, this is exactly what I do. And I'll quote this verse to him. Galatians 1, verse number, well, I'll start in verse number 6 says, or verse number, yeah, verse number 6 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you in the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. See, these people bring a perversion of, of the gospel. It's not the true gospel. It's, it's changed. It's twisted. It's perverted. Verse number 8 says, um, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The exact opposite of bidding someone a good day. Hey, God bless you. No, God curse you because you are spreading a false gospel. You have perverted the gospel of Christ, and that is not something to take lightly. You can have a different opinion on a lot of other things, but when someone's going around and telling you you have to work your way to heaven to be saved, I've got a problem with that, and God has a problem with that. He says, let them be accursed. I'll try to show them the gospel right off the bat. Say, hey, let me show you where you guys are wrong because you, you, don't, you don't believe right. I want to show you what the Bible says about this. And if they're not going to, if they're not going to receive it, if they're not going to listen, then I am not going to bid them a good day. I always tell them, stay out of our neighborhood, stay away from my house, stay away from my neighbors because you're teaching a false gospel and the Bible says that you need to be accursed. And it's not the nicest thing to say to people, okay? But I try to live my life based off of what this book says I ought to do, not based off of what people think are, is nice. Now, anyone who knows me knows that, that I'm a pretty friendly person. And it's not like I'm just flying off the handle, just everybody. But when someone's bringing a false doctrine like that, I'm going to try to do what the Bible says. I'm going to obey the doctrine that's found in this book. And... and you know, hopefully you could do say, hopefully you could see, yep, that's what the Bible says. The, the, this is how we handle ourselves in that situation. It's this teaching. We need to learn in, in all situations of our life. We need to learn what the Bible says. We get this from good doctrine. From the doctrine that's found in the Bible. So, um, and, and the best way for you to know what that doctrine is is to read the Bible for yourself daily. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your words and um, for the great doctrines that are found in the Bible. Dear God, I pray that you would please help us to understand the doctrines. Lord, help us not to be deceived by those that, that preach a false doctrine and um, that bring that leaven in, dear Lord. Help us to, to be able to identify that. Help us to know, Lord, teach us through the Holy Spirit. Help us to understand because we're all, everyone that's here is interested in the truth. We want to know what is true from your word. That's what we want to do. We, we, we have a desire to live our lives in a way that's going to be pleasing to you. And the only way that we know that we can do that is if we understand the truth from your word. God, I pray that you please help me as pastor of this church to only teach things that are right and true, that are sound doctrine, dear Lord, and that you would, you would help me to understand these things and that you'd help everybody here to just read on their own, to teach them individually, dear Lord, as well. And, and help us all to grow in grace and to grow in truth and that we wouldn't just be spiritual babies, dear Lord, but that we would be able to consume the, the true meat of your word and also to be able to go out and teach others, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.